Thank you very much. And thank you for being here today in this great event. And uh, let me just uh, take this opportunity to congratulate Mohammed, the whole team, Sean, for the magnificent organization and the excellent uh, discussion that we have been uh, witnessing throughout the whole day. Um, I was announced as ambassador, but in reality, I'm, I'm here to be quite provocative. But let me start by sharing with you this. I have a, I have a picture which I would like to share with you. For those who are not familiar, this is the worship of Memon. The worship of Memon is a painting by Evelyn de Morgan, 1909. And uh, Memon, inspired in the New Testament, is the, the biblical personification of greed. And uh, any priest, any rabbi, any iman uh, will tell you that you cannot serve God if you serve Mammon. Put, put it in another way. You cannot do what's good and right if greed clouds your judgment and if greed, greed guides your actions. As you know, I cannot be accused of being a, a heart history professor or an expert in theology, but I know human nature and I know sport. And for this reason, I know that the mother of all problems, the root of all threats that is facing sport and dragging its name and reputation to the mud is greed, human greed institutional greed. Greed for power, greed for money, greed for fame. And it used to be that sport was a school of values and it stood for fairness, honor and integrity. Sport was indeed meant to be the ultimate expression of these values. But today, greed is eating the soul and essence of the sport we love. And that is sadly the truth. Of course, greed does not explain everything. Sports reputation would not be at such a shameful state if it was not for poor governance, poor regulation, lack of oversight, and lax attitude from governments, from sports governing bodies, and other authorities. It was precisely this cocktail of, of uh, factors that created, fueled, facilitated, a permissive climate, a permissive climate that in turn has facilitated all the uh, illicit behavior, the conflicts of interests, the criminal activities, in summary, all the evils that are dragging the sports name through the mud. So if sport is in this state, it's also because leadership and courage are lacking. And unless this changes, the situation can only get worse and worse. And the situation is very serious. Very serious indeed. So I ask you, take a step back. Look, look in front of you. Consider the enormity of the situation. Look to what is happening. You have sport-related crimes such as transnational money laundry, tax evasion, bribery. You have fraudulent activities like sports betting, rising, growing exponentially. And in soccer's uh, specific and high profile case, global prosecution and law enforcement actions taken by the United States and Switzerland. And also in Germany this morning, tax authorities raiding an important sports body are unfolding a series of cataclysmic events which truly affects the reputation and integrity of sport. I think I don't need to go into details. I think you all know the facts quite too well. But I need to emphasize that these brutal developments have a huge impact on the image of sport and not just football and not just FIFA because what we are, are witnessing is a systemic, is an, an uh, epidemic uh, problem uh, which the whole sport uh, is now facing increasing levels of scrutiny. 
And sport is not just in trouble, it is in the midst of catastrophe. And for this reason, I ask you simple questions. First, is sport able of tackling single-handed these complex challenges? Has sport the ability and the legal means to tackle such increasing complex, sophisticated, multi-jurisdictional problems involving often organized crime? Is the traditional self-regulation powers of sport fit for purpose? Can the gaps and the problems that we are seeing in the governance of so many sports bodies across the world be addressed on the, simple, on the, on the basis of simply, simply fixing the current system? I think the answers to these questions can only be one, and the answer is no. The problems are too serious, the problems are too big, and they are too complex to be tackled by sport alone. So what do we do? In the face of this catastrophe, what do we do? I tell you what do we do. First of all, we need to confront ourselves. We need to, we need to look ourselves in the mirror. And we need, we need to ask, do we continue to navel gaze? Do we reject the help of others simply because we are afraid it may hurt our personal position or institutional pride? Do we refuse to acknowledge because of childish jealousy, because of obsolete self-preservation instinct, because of absurd illusion of territorial dominance? Do we refuse to acknowledge that other stakeholders have equally legitimate rights and legitimate interests and can play also an important positive role in uh, solving the problems that affect sport? Do we continue in denial do we continue in denial, even when some of the largest international sports federations are now on their knees, their leaderships are decapitated, and sport is in convulsion? No, absolutely not. We change, we adapt, we evolve, we fight back, we move on. And we fight to protect the integrity of sport and restore its reputations. And for this reason, please mark my words, if we continue this approach in isolation, working in a fragmented way, we will not solve any problems. On the contrary, we will only contribute to aggravate the consequences. The problems are big, they are too endemic, and the destruction is also widespread. To accept that sport needs help is not a sign of weakness of sport. On the contrary, it's a sign of wisdom and maturity. It's a sign of seriousness and strength. And that is why it is time to think bigger. It is time to be bolder. It is time to take more decisive action. For me, the case is simple. Sport owns the problems. It must also own the solutions. To do that, sport must come forward with quick action. Sport must, must commit to moving beyond old structures and old mentalities. We need a new culture. Not just new leadership, not just new protagonisms, we need a new culture. And that can only be done moving forwards, moving towards a new and truly emancipated sports governance of the entire sports movement. More than ever, the sports industry needs a new, independent space. A space where sports bodies come together with partners who bring expertise and the means in the areas of good governance, global financial regulation, government support, public-private partnerships, and anti-corruption and anti-match fixing and anti-sports fraud. A space with zero tolerance for corruption, bribery, and financial impropriety, and for which integrity is number one priority. A space to set universal standards for all sports organizations to adopt in order to bring real and lasting change. The momentum is definitely growing. Increasing calls are being voiced. Increasing calls are being made for a credible, coordinated, holistic, global approach with the support from the industry. Sponsors, media, governments, international authorities, NGOs like ICSS and other key stakeholders, all of us, we feel that the moment has, has come to set a new era in the integrity of sport. And that involves 
the need for an international global integrity platform for sport. This is what the industry is calling. You talk to a, a taxi driver in the streets of any city. You talk in your office, you talk in your school, you talk in, the, in your barber. This is what people ask. Enough is enough. This has to change. And that requires a new global, independent, neutral alliance. A coalition of the willing led by the sports industry and support by key stakeholders. Committed to work in a collaborative fashion. Committed to creative global solutions to large global problems. Committed to using best practice, proven industry standards and targeted capacity and research. Demanding that both problems and solutions are owned by the right stakeholders with a real commitment to action. An alliance, ladies and gentlemen, an alliance committed to moving beyond the idea of fixing problems and towards creating a new culture entirely. An alliance, ladies and gentlemen, an alliance committed to build a new foundation for governance, integrity, transparency in the sports industry. Since the FITS Forum, I have spoken with so many people, so many organizations. I have traveled more than I wished. I have spoken with uh, NGOs, with governments, with international organizations. I have spoken with sponsors, with fans, pretty much everybody. And out of these conversations, there was one strong idea. And that idea was time is right to usher a new era in terms of sports governance and integrity in sport. Yesterday, not far from here, we met with some uh, of our colleagues from the international sport community. We discussed the need for a coordinated multi-stakeholder approach, a united front with a common vision and a strong reformist impetus. Not only they agreed that we need the Sport Integrity Global Alliance, they were even excited about the prospect. They were passionate, they were energetic, they were all in. And the moment continues today in this room because by coming to this conference, I believe that you two are all in on bringing greater integrity, greater transparency and accountability to sport for those who run it, for those who play it and for those who enjoy it. And I believe that the spark of a new objective sports integrity global alliance is here in this very same room. And uh, for those who have doubts, for those who think that this cannot be done, let me tell you. In uh, 1755, Lisbon, the capital city of my country, was destroyed by a monumental earthquake. 90% of the population died. 90% of the population died. 85% of all infrastructure was destroyed. More than 70% of books and pieces of art, including uh, Rubens, uh, Tiziano, Carreggio, were lost forever. And then, in the middle of that catastrophe, one man, the Prime Minister, uh, Marquis de Pombal, did not waste time to give instructions. And he said, bury the dead, take care of the wounded. And on that precise moment, from the ashes of the destroyed city, a new, bright Lisbon was born. If I quote this example, it's not because to emphasize how destructive can be these, these events, but also to quote an example of leadership. And that is what happened precisely on the 3rd of November, 260 years ago. Adversity, my friends, is like my, my, my father used to say, is break some men, but makes other break records. And who can also forget what happened in Europe at the end of World War II? Europe was in, in shambles. Entire cities were reduced to rubble. Economies were fragments of their own selves. If someone did not step up and come to their aid, the continent would be in ruins. But luckily, someone did. American Secretary of State George Marshall, under the direction of President Truman, instituted the Marshall Plan. 
an unprecedented economic aid and recovery program. The US injected in Europe $100 billion back then. The economy was modernized, war-torn regions, regions were rebu rebuilt, Europe was brought back from the brink. Although I'm not uh, an historian or uh, expert in theology, uh, I can see the parallels, and so can you. We humans, we are tough, we are resilient. We find solutions to the most challenging of problems. In times of great strife, we can find hope. Leaders with clear vision can emerge, and those leaders can fix the unfixable. They can solve the unsolvable save the unsavable and do the impossible because if we really want it impossible is nothing ladies and gentlemen this is a defining moment sport is much more than in crisis sport is in the, br the brink of precipice but i believe we can master the leadership and the support to return sport to its former essence it will not be easy it will not be easy we have probably to fight against not only uh, entrenched outside forces, but inertia and resilience from within sport. And I can almost hear in this room uh, Pierre de Coubertin at the uh, 1894 conference in Paris, because he, he too stood against old mentalities and spurred a new era in sport. And he said, the adherents of the old school groaned when they saw us holding our meetings in the heart of Sorbonne. They realized that we were rebels and we would finish by casting down the edifice of their worm eaten philosophy. That's what he said. Today, I can almost sense him in this room. Today, I can almost feel the founder of the International Olympic Committee, the founder of the modern Olympic Games. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are a little bit reb rebels. We fight for a cause, a novel cause. We fight against the system that has tolerated greed and corruption. We do so in the name of sport, in the name of the values it represents. I believe we can win this fight, and I believe together with your support, we can overcome any obstacle, we can climb any mountain, we can make a new era for sport. Thank you very much.